Thank you. I now look to my treasurer, Armand Nawaz, to open the case for the proposition. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President, for giving me this exciting and a long, long awaited opportunity to speak in this historical chamber. After serving four terms on the Union Committee and telling my mom and dad every term that I will get a speech one of these terms, my time has finally come and I shall deliver. <clears throat> Malcolm X famously said, whenever you hear a man saying he wants freedom, but in the next breath, he tells you what he won't do to get it, or what he doesn't believe in doing in order to get it. He doesn't believe in freedom. A man who believes in freedom will do anything under, under the sun to acquire or preserve his freedom. Indeed today, my friends, as, I, as it has always been the case throughout the course of history, that every great thing requires a great sacrifice. And yes, on occasion, that means engaging in actions that some may question, in actions which some may feel uncomfortable with, and in actions others may fear. However, I am proud to stand in proposition as the agitation for freedom is inherent to the human condition, and to do what is necessary is to defend oneself from a world which would otherwise ignore the cries of the most vulnerable. If that is wrong, I don't want to be right. I will put forward two points today to you all. Firstly, that in many circumstances, one must be willing to do what is necessary to achieve any change at all in the first place. Secondly, that a world in which the necessary is not done is a world in which powerful elites are able to dictate society with neither scrutiny nor accountability. But before I get into my points, the duty falls on me as the first speaker of proposition to introduce the opposition for today's debate. Introducing the first speaker on, uh, introducing the first speaker on side opposition, Rachel Ojo, University College, whose attendance tonight is no surprise given her consistent attendance at every social imaginable in the run-up to presidential elections. <laughs> Next, you will hear from Ms. Helen King, former assistant commissioner of the Metropolitan Police and PPEist from St. Anne's College, Oxford. I know it's difficult for you all to hear, but Helen also did a postgraduate diploma at Cambridge. But we're very pleased that she came to her senses again and returned as of 2017 as the principal of St. Anne's College. <laughs> the third speaker on side opposition is Rehan Assad. Rehan, you're an incredible person. I was struggling to try to roast you at all. Uh, she became a Yale World Fellow last year, a scheme which is described as a program for rising global leaders. And the final speaker on side opposition is Peter Thatchell. Peter Thatchell is a pioneer of LGBTQ plus movements. He's no stranger to politics. Uh, running with the Labour Party in 1981, and he has now switched over to the Green Party. So it's good to see that he would fit in well with the politics we see here at the Oxford Union. That's not the only reason Thatchell might feel at home this evening, actually. He also co-founded uh, co the LGBT rights group Outrage, which is the sort of slate name we might expect in a few years when all the good ideas have gone out. <laughs> Madam President, these are your guests and they're most welcome. <laughs> On to the issues that we're facing tonight. Before I delve deeper into my arguments, there are two most important clarifications that I want to make in front of the House. Firstly, for something to be necessary, it is essential and it needs to be done to achieve an outcome. Therefore, you cannot let the opposition pretend that there is no harm to their stance of inaction. Their refusal to do what is necessary means that they have to oppose some of the most important advances in social justice that have and will be achieved by the world because they are not prepared to fight for them and they do not believe that these advances to be worth it. Well, opposition, we believe they are. Secondly, we do not support actions which are actively detrimental to a cause and its principles, such as wanton violence, as they are the opposite, really, of what is necessary to achieve um, an aim. This debate, ladies and gentlemen, boils down to one question. Should we be willing to do, should we be willing to make sacrifices to fight for the things that we deeply care about? 
I will convince you tonight that the answer is yes. As I stated before, well, sorry. Secondly, we do not support actions which are actively detrimental. Sorry, I have covered this. <laughs> this debate, uh, as I've stated before, my point is, sorry, let me start again. As I stated before, my point is that often change only happens when people are prepared to do whatever is necessary to achieve it. The first reason why that is the case is when fighting for change, numbers matter. And when you're only able to mobilize enough people to fight oppressive power, when everyone is willing to turn up and fight for their rights and the rights of others. Imagine, everyone, if in America in 1965, those brave civil rights protesters had not marched from Selma to Montgomery to highlight the injustice in their, and their suffering. Despite facing the threat of certain violence and possible death, they pressed onwards, thousands in numbers, with hope in their hearts for a brighter future for themselves and their children. Thanks to them, millions of people around the world enjoyed rights which would have been impossible only 60 years ago. You know, often a collective action problem exists wherein everyone benefits from social justice advances. But very few people are left to fight an ineffective and infinitely more precarious battle to achieve these societal advances. It is only when we all willing to do whatever is necessary, when we all accept that there may be financial pain, time forgone and risk suffered that we break free of the cycle of attempting to adapt to the shackle of our injustices. And with safety in numbers, declare that enough is enough with such force and unity that we cannot be ignored. The second reason why I believe that change happens is that it is only when a cause is willing to do whatever is necessary that they display the level of conviction and sacrifice necessary to be able to credibly threaten oppressors into committing to change. From our ivory tower of relative comfort here in the West, we conveniently avoid discussions on how hopes of our uh, heroes of our time had to engage in actions which we may disagree with for the greater good. Who, for example, in this room is willing to stand up today and tell me that Nelson Mandela, a global hero and leader on the, of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, was wrong, was wrong to create and lead the resistant organization. Despite his campaigns of bombing and combat being a crucial driver to the end of apartheid, who can tell me that Nelson Mandela was wrong in leading that movement? Sure, sanctions and international condemnation were also effective, but it is disingenuous and naive to ignore the need, the necessity to do things which, may not ordinarily, which we may not ordinarily accept, support, or do when the circumstances demand action. So it is clear without being willing to do whatever is necessary, too often you achieve nothing at all. And this is unacceptable for us on side proposition. Finally, I would like to make clear that equity and accountability in society can only exist when the disenfranchised are willing to make sacrifices to be listened to. I wish, I wish so badly that the world was not like this, that this was not the case, and that things could be different. However, often, unfortunately, the burden falls on the neglected to stand up and be heard before anyone notices and starts to care. To suggest that we ought to strive for a world where this was not the case is to ignore the reality of elite capture of our system. The insidious money, nature of money in politics, the control of media, the control of media narrative by cartel of media moguls and the shadowy corridors of exclusive golf clubs where the movers and shakers of the society make deals with no regard for an average Joe are, present, are presently insurmountable barriers. The, the consequence of this is that for the rich and powerful, the debate we are having, having today is merely an academic discussion. Influencing the system in their favor is as easy as click of the fingers. To challenge the powerful, we must make sacrifices that the most privileged don't have to. Sacrifices that they will vindictively and coercively oppose. Yet friends, it is worth it. The only way to hold elites to account is to say no to the divide and the rule, tact rule tactics 
uh, elites which employ and stand uh, united, which is a huge sacrifice that too often many are unwilling to make. For example, it is easier to blame immigrants than standing united in dealing with the rise in inequality the world has witnessed over the past decades. It is easier to engage in an I'm all right, Jack, mentality when seeing suffering around you, even though you could be the next victim. And it is easier to ignore the horrific treatment of Uyghur Muslim in China than to take stand for what is right. Doing what is necessary means calling out oppression whenever you see it, regardless of how powerful the oppressor is. The costs may be steep, the, ca the sacrifices may be high, but the outcome of creating a better future for ourselves and our children will always be worth it. And that is why I propose side proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad, for that fine speech.